So microfinance is, is, as you know, many people are looking forward to hear about microfinance, but I want to put microfinance in the context of the financial can inclusion campaign that Bangladesh has been making there. Agent banking and mobile banking will be coming automatically. Uh, Dr. Ali, I'll be, I'll be, if I, if I fail to uh, satisfy your uh, 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 the queries, please come back again, you know, so let's move into uh, the financial inclusion part of it. Cholo, yeah. Uh, the next slide, please. Bangladesh uh, uh, is an amazing journey, I told you, and the financial inclusion innovations are also, you know, in a, in a, a very well known all around the world. That Bangladesh, uh, the financial inclusion campaign that we started in the from 2009, you know, it has been really uh, uh, very, very brand name for Bangladesh and microfinance was already there in Bangladesh and we added few more financial inclusion uh, policies for the for the banks and that really helped us. Uh, in 1971, Bangladesh grew out of a strong national aspiration for equity. As you know, the entire struggle between East Pakistan and West Pakistan was based on equity. You know, we wanted to fair share of the, of the resources and that was the reason and many of the uh, 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 people really, uh, the farmers, uh, the, the workers were not better off and that was the uh, reason that Bangladesh had to really go into that uh, war. It is indeed a social laboratory. Bangladesh is a social laboratory which has been thriving on innovations of low-cost solutions for inclusive development. And a lot of, as you said, Dr. Ali, a lot of innovations have been taking place in Bangladesh in terms of financial inclusion. The country today is being considered as a global trendsetter of sustainable inclusive development, mainly because of these innovations. The country is deep into the process of digital transformation, benefiting significantly from the accessing state of the earth digital technology. Our FinTech and others are, are really you know, state of the earth and a lot of innovations going on. And the central bank is leading the move in, in, in that sense. Uh, we have a, uh, you know, Bangladesh is a, is a country which believes in complementarity between the state and I don't know why. Ah, that's it. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, it's, it's a complementary between the state and the non-state actor. That has been key to the Bangladesh strength, actually. It's a, there has been a paradigm shift, you know. Uh, 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 complementary efforts of the non-state actors, including markets with the state, that has been the key to it. And uh, people have been pretty, very innovative. And uh, uh, also the government has been very courageous in, in encouraging you know, you know, uh, the NGOs and also private sector. You know, and government has only been uh, working as, as a regulator and, and, and uh, uh, encouraging uh, others to really work for uh, the country. So this uh, paradigm shift has been very crucial for Bangladesh. And Bangladesh has been following prudent policies for inclusive growth uh, by uh, uh, extending digital connectivity. Bangladesh uh, has really, if you remember in 2008 election, the current prime minister uh, gave a call for digital Bangladesh, that we will have all the services digital, all the finance digital, everything will be digital. And I happened to be the governor immediately after that. And I found that the central bank at that time was not at all prepared for that digital transformation. But then we really transformed the entire central bank into a digital central bank. And now we are, we are getting the results. And the entire, even the public banks are now running digitally. So that, in fact, the pandemic has been a great boon for us and for most of the countries because most of the countries are now really doing banking from their home, actually, you know, and in Bangladesh, the real time gross settlements and everything, all the automatic clearing houses and all we have done it in Bangladesh, which has given a digital connectivity for all the banks and financial institutions. Again, uh, we have enhanced financial inclusion beyond, uh, uh, you know, microfinance. Uh, because uh, through mobile financial services, agent banking, and many other uh, innovative measures that we have taken. Do you, I'm sure you are aware, every farmer in Bangladesh probably has a bank account. We call it 
and a 10 taka account in, in Bangladesh, you know, you know, so that's the kind of push we gave for financial inclusion. No, only 10% of our, you know, accounts are dormant where, you know, the, the, the South Asian average could be 30 or 28%, you know, the dormant accounts. So that means we have been pushing financial inclusion and we are expanding social safety nets, you know, you know all the time. Uh, a lot of social safety nets. Now we are coordinating those because there are too many in numbers. And uh, uh, Bangladesh has experienced a resilient growth and huge potential. Uh, uh, I have already talked about it. Uh, 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 GDP growth last year was 8.13%, almost 2,000 per capita income. And the per capita GDP in 2030 uh, uh, will be even better. Challenges, employment creation, clean energy, uh, export diversification, financial stability, investment. These are the challenges that we have to really face and we were working on it. Uh, the financial inclusion made a pivotal role in terms of uh, 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 you know, uh, social inclusion. In fact, financial inclusion really encourage social social cohesion you know if you if you can give money to the people only then you can really bring them on board you know so to uh, and again financial inclusion help to foster inclusive growth and uh, uh, and uh, uh, it has opened up block opportunities for the poor the many poor uh, were not having access to the banks uh, accounts so through this innovative means you know we have allowed them to really uh, uh, open new opportunities. Say, for example, a rickshaw puller in Dhaka, you know, would will have to go to his house on to take the money and give it to his wife so that she can buy food. But uh, earlier, about it took about a month or two to really make that transactions. Uh, and uh, around that one month or so, you know, she used to really uh, uh, in a difficult situation to give food to her sons and daughters. So she had to depend on the local uh, shops to get the food on credit. And that was very unstable. Consumption was very, very unstable. Now every day he can make double transaction, at least two transactions to his wife so that the money goes to immediately. And that makes the consumption pretty, pretty stable. So the poor have been benefiting from the agent banking and the mobile banking in terms of stabilizing their consumption and also creating a lot of demand in the, in, the, in, the, in the country. The poor became bankable without collateral, uh, thanks to the microfinance. In fact, uh, microfinance history in Bangladesh is well known, I'm sure. And the microfinance innovations ensured uh, the collateral free loans and helped the marginal household break the vicious cycle. And what we did now, you know, uh, you know, we have linked the microfinance institutions with the banks so that the M MFIs can have a linked program with the bank. You know, that has given us a lot of, uh, you know, uh, opportunities. Uh, the, peop uh, the uh, people have, uh, uh, you know, they have lo lack of savings, their income is low, investment low, so they also get a lot of low credit. Then came in microfinance and microfinance ensured collateral free loans and helped the marginal household break the vicious cycle. The vicious cycle which we are seeing, microfinance real, really created that. Microfinance is not a bank. Microfinance is a very informal kind of institution and it really uh, you know, works with the poor, very informal poor. They don't ask for your you know, you know, you know, trade license. They don't ask for your you know, you know, uh, tax uh, index. You know, they just uh, go and give the money. Uh, and when a microfinance gives the money to a household, you know, one of the microfinance worker will visit uh, her uh, or him uh, to buy the cow for him or her. You know, you know that's the kind of uh, supervision they make. And that's why they have 90 plus recovery all the time. And my Bangladesh microfinance story is globally known, not only for Grameen Bank, but also for about 700 plus other microfinance institutions, which are really contributing to, uh, uh, you know, Bangladesh uh, uh, inclusive development. Finance is a, is a, is a, is a thing we need to really be careful. You know, uh, uh, the financial inclusion is the way to eradicate poverty. In in fact, in 2018. Uh, uh, the vice president of the World Bank, Sela uh, Pazarbasiglu, uh, gave a speech in Singapore. And she said, 
I really think we are not going to eradicate poverty unless we have financial inclusion. You have good finance, bad finance, and ugly finance. You need to make it serve citizens, the SMEs, and not just the banker or the wealthy or the chosen few. My 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 own words, you know, and she did it uh, maybe after 10 years, but never mind, you know, that, that global institutions are recognizing that financial inclusion is the key to really help people go out. So we need to really, we made a lot of collective effort to enable regulatory environment for the microfinance. The early experimentation, the Kumilla model you are sitting in or looking at the model, you know, and the BRDB, these were the early models through cooperatives we wanted to reach. Then came the microfinance proliferation in the 1970s and the 80s and regulatory challenges were that, you know, the, you need to uh, use their savings, you know, and now even now 80% of the microfinance uh, deposits are really coming from their members, their savings, and they are recycling it back into the uh, you know, credit uh, uh, format and the insurance services as well. And uh, NGO Bureau, you know, there is an NGO Bureau uh, and, and the PKSF, they have been also uh, overseeing the fund transfer and innovations in Bangladesh. This, this is, these are uh, the innovations. Then in 2006 came the Microcredit Regulatory Authority, this is something which many countries in our part of the world have not opted for. Bangladesh opted for a regulatory body called MRA, which is like a central bank. And again, there is a link between MRA and the central bank. The central bank governor, I was the uh, chairman of this uh, organization. You know, all the time, the central bank governor is the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the chairman of the regulatory authority so that if the NGOs need money, you know, we can really, uh, as a chairman of the of the board, we can immediately connect it with the, with the bank so that they can give it to the, and we have done it even in this recovery phase, you know, we are giving money from the central bank to the bank and the MFIs are taking money from the MF uh, bank and then giving it to the to the people so this was a very smart move i would say very innovative move and it's a it's, it's a it's a central bank mark two i would call mra so that that gave us a lot of lot of uh, you know leeway uh, in terms of taking the money to the poor next uh, so the creating an enabling environment of MFIs has always been there and linking banks with the NGO MFIs, you know. So, uh, and uh, it is uh, because of this linkage, you know, uh, the uh, uh, MSME, that means micro, small and media enterprises are now getting finance, employment, they are creating non-farm income generating activities, they are doing a lot. And uh, we have also out uh, enhance our rural outreach by providing uh, in a lot of agricultural finance. I don't know if many other countries, Indians do, uh, do it definitely, uh, priority lending, they do it. But we did a, a thing that uh, we made it compulsory for even foreign banks in Bangladesh. You know, not only the uh, public banks, the private banks, the foreign banks, we made it compulsory that certain percentage of where money must go to the farmers. And if they fail, you know, I remember the Standard Chartered Bank once failed. So we took away the, 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 that amount of money and put it in a separate account without any rate of interest, you know. So that gave a huge indication that others will have to follow the suit. Next year, nothing like that happened. So we really could do that. And then private banks, foreign banks all came in for uh, agricultural credit. So women empowerment uh, has been because we gave a special focus on on women entrepreneurship, you know, and yeah, we uh, we asked every bank to open a women uh, uh, entrepreneurship help desk in every branch of the bank so that if the women come in and 15% uh, of the refinance was really, uh, uh, you know, ensured for the women, unless they gave this refinance to women, we didn't allow a man to take money from the bank. Actually, that was the and a push that we gave, uh, you know, in terms of women empowerment uh, through the central bank and sustainable finance. As I told you, we created a green finance and we have a department of called sustainable finance in the central bank to push, uh, 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 you know, green finance. And we have a department called Department of Financial Inclusion to push financial inclusion with the, with the MFIs in the, in the central bank. Uh, and we have an, another department on SMEs. So the... Uh, 
uh, earlier it used to be from the development partners in you know, early MFIs were all uh, you know development partners driven but the Bangladesh MFI sector is now almost self-reliant you know you can see that almost 13 percent of the uh, you know uh, the money they get from the bank uh, and a uh, public finance also about one person and the market uh, uh, and the rest of them are getting from their own members you know market potential is drawing more investment from local commercial banks now and we created a lot of linkage program even central bank created its own refinance lines with the microfinance initial straight you know i gave about 500 crore plus every year to the uh, 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 BRAC so that they can create money only for the tenant farmers and the sharecroppers and women farmers. So that was a kind of innovations that we took in, in Bangladesh to push microfinance for the, for the poor. Uh, next. Uh, and the outreach, microfinance outreach has been increasing pretty fast. Within the last decade, microfinance disbursed annually has almost quadrupled currently catering to demand of about 31 million borrowers you can see the uh, trend through the through the through the uh, diagrams uh, all of you will have a copy of this presentation so you can use them for your own use you know uh, we will leave a copy with with, with you uh, so uh, and again uh, with the, with the increase in the in the microfinance outreach the efficiency has also increased as the as the sector matured you can see that you know the recovery rate next please the recovery rate uh, is 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 uh, uh, has been really in more than 92 percent all the time 90 plus percent you know and again a loan disbursed per borrower more than triple within the last decade while the recovery rate remained consistently over 90 percent so this is a very uh, good earlier about you know uh, uh, people used to get about uh, uh, 13,000 Taka uh, per borrower. In a decade's time, this has gone up to about uh, you know thirty-five thousand or something like that. So this is a very uh, in a heroic uh, also movement uh, going on. So and this uh, uh, microfinance, you know, it has been really uh, promoting entrepreneurship uh, uh, significantly. You can see that income from agriculture constitutes now only about 20% of the household income and the MFIs contributor significantly in boosting non-farm income in the rural areas. More than 60% of our income in the rural areas are from the non-farm sector. And, and, and MFIs really cater to the needs of this non-farm sectors. You can see on the left side that how they are providing money to different trade and business MSME, housing, food processing, what not, you know, they are having, having, and these are mostly informal kind of sector actually, and they are getting the money from, from the MFIs. Uh, uh, going, uh, government is also going uh, beyond microfinance to augment human development. As you can see, uh, 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 MFI services are also giving a uh, lot of services to, for human development. Almost 50 million people receive healthcare, education, Watson, family planning, HIV awareness, and legal assistance in a given year from MFIs operating across Bangladesh and sometimes in collaboration with the government. You know, in, a, in, the, in the local level, the government and the MFIs really collaborate and cooperate and, and they uh, 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 go for this kind of non-financial services, which are, that's why the Bangladesh, you know, you know social development uh, indicators are so good because of these uh, institutions are on, on the ground. Uh, next look at the income effect you know uh, uh, the, between uh, 2010 and 2017 you know this is one of my research uh, findings you know the household income of borrowers increased by 61 percent that for non-borrowers increased by 42 percent so you can see the difference how the income rises with the with the, with the mfi borrowers on the expenditure side average monthly expenditure of borrowers is over nine percent higher than that of a non-borrower as i told you you know the mfis are also pushing the you know consumption in the in the rural areas and and consumption uh, stability is a, is a very good thing for poverty reduction as you all know both income and expenditure of the old borrowers have been found to be higher than those of the relatively new borrowers and implying long-term participation in microfinance programs 
deepens financial inclusion. So uh, I wanted to integrate financial inclusion with the microfinance institution. That's why, you know, these are uh, synergistic, you know, and they are working together, you know, the banks and, and, and the MFIs. Impact on savings, asset building and investment. Average household savings for borrowing household is 84% higher than that of a non-borrowing household. So you, you can see how much they are. And it, they are like a handholds kind of system. You know, MFIs are really in, all around the country and giving that money. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a huge uh, amount, about 150,000 <coughs> crore taka investment going on in the rural areas from MFI. Ownership of tin shed buildings. You know, if you, if you see the, uh, my friend from India, uh, I'm sure a lot of your houses are still uh, thatched, but in Bangladesh, you will not find uh, any, any of the thatched houses. You know, most of the houses are tin shed with the, with the concrete uh, uh, floor and, and walls. And you can see for yourselves, the Bangladesh rural areas looks very urban, you know, in a, in a, in a hundred percent electricity and also houses are, are, are much uh, stronger. And, uh, uh, and again, uh, the ownership of the tin shed buildings have increased at a higher rate for borrowers compared to the non-borrowers, you know, you know, it's about 10 plus percentage. <clears throat> Investment for business expansion was significantly higher than their non-borrowing counterparts, more than 16 percent points, you know, they, they say that, it, uh, you know, in fact, today's microfinance is actually micro enterprises. You know, these are these are all our entrepreneurs. You know, you know they are doing hardly any small uh, finance. You know, these are a uh, few lakhs of rupees or taka. You know, in the in the in the in the hands of the each borrower. So this is something which is uh, helping us. Uh, uh, next, please financing the real economy. Actually, microfinance is helping us to improve the real economy. Uh, uh, formal finance and NGO uh, uh, MFI collaboration has really helped us uh, reach the people. About there are 18 million ten taka, as I told you, 0 0.12 dollars uh, uh, bank account. Uh, these are, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, very informal bank account. You know, uh, they uh, they couldn't do KYC, uh, but uh, they use the uh, uh, you know, NID now, and now they are opening 10 Taka accounts. You know, this is something uh, which is very unusual because we wanted to move through the banks actually. And the bank accounts in Bangladesh has been increasing consistently. Agricultural credit increased by 130% in 10 years, over 2.6 billion disbursed in fiscal year 17 18. $433 million credit to 1.6 million sharecroppers were previously unbanked. And this money went straight from the central bank to a microfinance institute called Brock. So, and 62% of them were women, women uh, farmers. So this is kind of, I don't think any other central bank in the world would have dared to take the money straight from its own reserve to the, to the, to the uh, microfinance institute. And we did it. So micro insurance is also becoming popular among the microfinance. And you can see that uh, uh, social safety net programs are, uh, are not enough actually. So the most vulnerable need to be ensured. So affordable products for climate hotspots as well in some of the coastal zone, drought prone areas, Howard areas, Chittagong hill tracks, riverbank in, uh, uh, areas, uh, urban areas. You know, there now the MFIs are really doing micro insurance products, not only to protect the most vulnerable, but they are also necessary to protect the microeconomic gains, such as reduction in poverty. So this is another area microfinance is working called micro insurance. You know, they are doing a lot on, 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 on the grounds. Uh, early, and Bangladesh really did some early innovations of micro uh, insurance. Uh, uh, so for example, uh, uh, early innovations in Bangladesh, next please. Um, uh, uh, early innovations among that you know 10 million people currently are covered by the insurance in in bangladesh uh, and a sustainable part of the life insurance premium comes from micro insurance insurance mfis played a leading role in expansion of the savings linked micro insurance program in bangladesh uh, uh, one of the 
uh, examples I have given from Sajida Foundation, which is a, uh, you know, a very voluntary organization turned into microfinance later. Uh, they have started a program called Nirapatta, which is means security program, provided insurance uh, uh, support along with microfinance. You know, uh, you give microfinance, but you also uh, give a certain percentage of it into a insurance so that, you know, even if you fall sick, you know, you can come back and, and get the money back through the insurance. You know, you know. This contributed significantly in enhancing customer confidence in insurance products. 67 beneficiaries are now willing to pay. So uh, once you can uh, uh, you know, combine micro insurance with microfinance, you get a better you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know confidence level goes up from uh, among the borrowers so, so they they can get back the money you know you know if they're in trouble another ngo hushful is providing low cost life insurance product for slum dwellers in urban slums in chottogram city microcredit program participants are eligible to go for that kind of micro insurance so so that micro insurance is helping a microfinance in 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 the country so so far uh, i have been very fast in terms of giving an overview of the microfinance let me share a few more slides on how we are coping further with the covid 19 and uh, uh, covid 19 uh, uh, needed further innovations and uh, mfis are passing through the uh, very difficult time as you all know uh, uh, i'm sure uh, in all the countries because for about 3 4 months uh, uh, this is also true in India, Nepal, and other countries. We could not open our economy. And the moment we stopped our economy, the microfinance were in deep trouble because they could not you know, take the savings from their uh, borrowers and they could not give the money to their uh, borrowers. You know? So they, the entire money has been now you know, lying there and it needs to be staggered probably. And that probably uh, will, will take away some of their you know, you know, uh, strength. And uh, in a, in a uh, survey, we have seen that 93% of the MFIs reported sharp rise in portfolio at risk uh, for 63% uh, percent, uh, portfolio at risk has more than doubled, and particularly the small enter, uh, you know, you know, NGOs or the small MFIs, they're having this risk because they got Cut. You know, the, the money they used to get from their borrowers was not allowed to, you know, taken because they couldn't go out and, and allow people to come nearer to them so because due to the you know, lockdown, you know, or the partial lockdown. So that has created a lot of risk in the MFIs. I'm sure this risk has been created in other countries as well. 27% of the MFIs said that they do not have adequate equity capital to cope with the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, I'll come back to the uh, you know you know you know uh, uh, the government move to uh, really uh, uh, remove some of these problems, but again, it's still not big enough. You know, so they have this liquidity problem now, having uh, because of the COVID crisis in, in Bangladesh. Fifteen percent of the small FFIs are availing deferral of repayment to banks, whereas the ratio for large is six to three. Small uh, NGOs. Uh, uh, took money from the banks and they wanted the referrals, but not all of them are getting the referrals, you know, so that is a, a problem because the banks are a bit careful about, about them. So the uh, uh, government has created a special fund for the MFIs uh, 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 and it's a, it's a renewable fund, uh, about 3000 crore taka fund, you know. Uh, the, any of the of the MFIs can take up to two percent of their portfolio uh, uh, from this fund from the banks. You know they have given the money to the central bank has given this three thousand to the banks so that an MFI can come to a bank and then say that I last year I gave hundred crore taka so you can give me two crore taka I like that. You know you know you have about three thousand crores and this will be renewable. You know if you finish this giving. And then you can come back, you can take it again, you can take it several times if you want, actually. So that kind of, you know, you know and the rate of interest is very low, around 4%, 3%, I think. So uh, that money is, is really going to the MFIs, but the small are uh, having problem in terms of, because banks sometimes ask for more papers from the smaller MFIs. The large, they do it very well, you know, 
uh, it, it happens even in the banking sector. If you are a large bank, you get the favor, you know, isn't it? So the large MFIs are doing better in terms of taking that, but the smaller ones are having problem in terms of a lot of paperwork. Even the banks ask for you know, fixed deposit. They said, if you give them 15% fixed deposit only, then I'll give you the you know, stimulus money to you. This is not fair because that means you are really not giving 15% of the money which the central bank has given you. You are keeping it with you, actually. You know, you know, so that is something we need to talk. And I have been talking to the central bank to be uh, more, uh, you know, to to ease more of this conditionality, so that uh, smaller MFIs can get uh, the money uh, as easily as possible. So I now have some suggestions to make. Protect basic income support to borrowing households and micro entrepreneurs. So in any case, we need to. Uh, provide uh, the borrowing households and the micro entrepreneurs so that basic income is not lost actually you know if 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 uh, the basic income is lost so what will happen that will have an, in a larger macroeconomic impact because if if the uh, domestic demand is affected so that will really create a lot of poverty a lot of a lot of uh, consumption will go down and uh, the economy even the you know you know you know the industries will not have enough domestic demand so i thought uh, it is for the interest of the macroeconomy that microeconomy need to be protected you know, you know that's something i thought uh, uh, i have to tell the central bankers you know when i was a, a governor i used to push it because become being an uh, economist i could understand the demand and supply problem you know what is going on in the demand so i think we need to be very careful and push the money to the bottom of the pyramid to create enough demand on the, uh, for the economy secondly come up with tailored policies for medium and small size mfis you cannot see that one size fits all you know large mfis can uh, can have one kind of policies uh, but but the small ones need to be nurtured and cared and uh, mra the microcredit regulatory authority should really work as a bridge between the bank and the mfi so that they should really help them to get the money uh, during these difficult days. I think uh, every country in the world has really flooded the uh, banks with the money or the liquidity and that money needs to go to the poor. You know, if it only goes to the rich, it doesn't help much. So I thought uh, these are the institutions who are working with the uh, as poor people. So they need to really get the support. Uh, designing clear repayment policy to restrict costs cross subsidiary by mfis sometimes the mfis take the money for one reason and then put the money for others you know, you know so i thought that cross subsidiary may not be useful at this stage because we really want the poverty not to go up really so mm -hmm. there should be no shift of money from the from the objective that has been created this money because this is taxpayers money you know you know you need to be careful in 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 the use of the money further collaboration and coordination with mffs uh, providers for suitable loan disbursement and loan repayment processes enhancing digital financial literacy in fact you know uh, uh, some of the mfis say buro bangladesh is one of the big mfis they are uh, you know making it a point that the money they are getting from the banks for a stimulus from the stimulus package will have to be distributed by mobile financial services and also collected by mobile financial services so that will mean lower cost because their you know workers don't have to go to the village uh, to sit down in the group meetings you know they can just do it through their mobile you know send the money to their mobile bank account and then return it so that will reduce the cost of the delivery of the microfinance i think the the pandemic has given us this historic opportunity of transforming the microfinance uh, uh, payment system into a link to the mobile financial services so is the case with the with the social safety net programs you know some of them are already working on it the wages are being given by the by the uh, mobile financial services. Secondly, considering regulatory changes. So for example, allowing MFIs to finance their lending by saving mobilization. I think uh, uh, sometimes there is a cap that this much you can allow your 
up and members to save. But I think in a pandemic situation, we can relax it and ease those, you know, you know, you know, you know, uh, uh, the restrictions that we provided because this is not an usual time. So it's an unusual time and we can take unusual policies uh, around this time, you know, if you really want. And I think uh, uh, I'll stop here and I'll take uh, uh, questions and we'll hear from our friends all around that how they are doing in the microfinance front.